It's 515, 516. Come in, come in. Wow, for 515, I can't believe the crowd is, is as big as it is. Nice. I figured it'd just be me and my, my cohorts. <laughs> Welcome to Bib Magic. Uh, my name is Blake Graham Henderson, and uh, I work at Mobius. We're out of Columbia, Missouri, a nice small town right in the middle of the, the state between St. Louis and Kansas City. Come if you can. It's a really great place to be. But here we are. We're talking about Bib Magic. Now, Bib is short for Bibliographic Mark Records. Is everybody familiar with those things? Okay. Super exciting stuff. Everybody, uh, I can see a lot of smiles out there. <clears throat> so... What is this thing that we're talking about? Does anybody know it? Everybody familiar with Bib Records? Yes. Let's see if this thing, this remote works. It didn't work. Oh, I have to click on got it. Hey. All right. So the, the whole premise here is that we want this stuff. Does this look familiar to anybody? <clears throat> Some files, mark files. We want that stuff to look like this stuff, that's what we're doing. All right, so introducing the Big Magic Importer. The Big Magic Importer is amazing, incredible, phenomenal, magnificent, spectacular. No actual Google citizens were harmed during the making of this slide. Uh, allow me to show you why it does this. Ongoing imports, so something that you regularly have to do, it'll just do it for you. Auto electronic scoping, it'll configure a list of participating libraries for electronic resources, and it'll automatically put their dollar sign nines on the A56s. It'll automatically, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> automatically merge any uh, subfield uh, nines, and it'll also detect duplicate bibs from multiple vendors. It'll also handle authority records. It will, uh, you, it makes silos, so it's designed for compartmentalized mark records per import projects. And it will remote record retrieval. So you, you don't necessarily need to manually feed it the files. It will go and get the files from FTP. Uh, Cloud Library is a specific vendor out there. It'll talk to Cloud Lib Library, which is an API-driven deal. They don't deal with Mark files. It's an API type stuff. And Markive HTTPS deliveries. It'll match existing records. So incoming Mark can scope match to its own set. So if it runs over and over again, it knows the records that it was responsible for importing the first time. And the second time it runs, it will then match against its own set and then do all the right stuff. Uh, it can be expanded to match any evergreen bib if you wanted to. And duplicate bibs are deduped and the 856s are merged based on the subfield mu. We'll get into that in a minute. And then the most recent feature we added to this tool was <clears throat> auto mark manipulation. So as the mark records are coming in from wherever they're coming in, if you wanna do things to those records before they go into Evergreen, you can do lots of different things. Um, add fields, remove fields or remove subfields, replace fields or replace subfields. Uh, and it also works with control fields as opposed to standard fields. Syncing the dollar sign nine. So <clears throat> for electronic imports, and this isn't specifically, this tool works with any mark records, but it also has special cases for electronic records. Um, it will retroactively add exist, uh, to existing A56s. So if you are importing electronic records on a regular basis, and then suddenly have a new library that wants to be a part of that record set, all you do is you add them to the config and run the sync and it'll go back through the Evergreen database and, and, and retroactively add their dollar sign nine to the 856 so that they're in the scope search in the Evergreen search. 
And then um, each job that runs, each job that this tool runs can be reported upon a finish. And, and when it starts, it'll fire off an email with, hey, I've started importing from Overdrive or wherever can be, or I've started off and then you'll get a finish report. And you can also use the Evergreen Reporter directly to make templates and get reports from what this tool has done in the past. One thing that's not on this slide actually is um, it can be reversed. So if it makes a mistake or you don't like what it did, you can back it back in time to the previous state of the records. All right. So is everybody excited about this thing? <laughs> so let's have a checklist of what you need in order to run this thing. Um, you will need access to the server, and it is one Perl program, and it's this thing right here, the BibMagic importer. And then there's an example config file. Okay. And this is what the command looks like whenever you kick off the software. It's pretty simple. It's, it's uh, trying to be as easy as possible. So literally you execute the script and you feed it a config file and that's it. Dot slash bib magic .pl, config overdrive.com or whatever. Maybe it could be the, the file name might be the name of the library that's participating or the system or whatever, whatever you want it to be. Uh, then there's an alternate command here. If you wanted to run the sync nines component of itself, you would do dash dash sync nines and it'll go back through all the evergreen database and read your config file and, and retroactively add all those nines we talked about a minute ago. And if you wanted it to just match on the 901C, which is the evergreen match point, uh, the, the ID number of the bib. So you can pass that and that way the matching is restricted to that. That would be in a case like Markive, or if you're sending all your bibs off to a vendor and then you're getting them back and you want them all just overlaid back from the vendor's cleanup process or whatever, you could pass that match 901C from the mark records coming back in and it'll just overlay the stuff that came back from the vendor. All right. Well, let's take a look at that config file. So that let me go back one slide. So we're passing this file, the config file you see there. And uh, you can probably imagine that there's a ton of stuff going on in that config file, lots of stuff, a lot of questions you might be having right now, like, how does it know, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> how does it know what I want? Well, it's all in that one file. Okay. So I've made a slide and it's cut off by the translation stuff down there, but um, this is the easy stuff. The config file has several different components to it, but th this is a list of all the stuff that's pretty easy to explain. So I put it all on one slide. The log file, so a place where you want that uh, log file to be written to as it executes its brains. Uh, the domain name, like your own domain name.com. Um, really, that's not that big of a deal if you don't put it in there. An archive folder, so a place on the server where it will um, put the files when they're done. So after they've been processed, it'll go into an archive folder place on the server where you can see what files it's actually been dealt with in the past. A uh, place to write temporary uh, stuff like authority processing stuff temporarily. Um, then if you are like I was in the previous slide, I was showing that it can import from FTP, right? Uh, it can import from cloud library and it can also be configured to import from uh, Markive's HTTPS, and one thing that wasn't on there was just a, a folder. So it can import Mark records from just a folder. So if you just don't have any other way to get the records to the server, you can just drop it into a folder on the server and it'll just process those. So there's a uh, incoming Mark folder config. You have to tell it where that folder is, and then you got to feed it all the Postgres uh, information, how to connect to your database. And then down at the bottom, there's a uh, do not import new flag. If you don't want it, if you don't want it to import anything that doesn't already exist in the database, if you set that to true, then it will be sure and not do that. Okay. So that's the easy stuff. Um, 
Here's some more stuff. So in the config, there's this thing called record source. Um, this I'll just read here. Um, the options here are FTP or folder or cloud library, library or archive HTTPS. And some examples of what the config would look like. You would say record source equals folder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I made a note there about cloud library. It, there's some extra sauce for cloud libraries. Anybody use cloud, cloud library, by the way? Anybody? Yeah, yeah. Do you import records into the catalog? Okay. Well, this might be helpful. Um, then I have another slide here that <clears throat> takes care of all of the remote server stuff. So you would need to tell this script the URL for the server, the remote server, where it's going to get this stuff. The login and the password, of course. If it's an FTP server, you know, there's a login and password component to it. If it's cloud library, then the login is becomes the library ID, your ID that cloud library assigned you. And then the password becomes your library API key in this case. Um, then a, a remote folder, if in an FTP case, it'll go out and go and uh, traverse a subdirectory on the FTP server and then go in there and find the files that you're looking for, that you want it to look for. And then recurse is an option if you wanted to just go through the entire tree of an FTP server, for example. Um, then there's another config here for last date file. That's only applicable for cloud library a file where it keeps track of the last time it ran. So it knows how far back in time to ask the cloud library server for bib records. So if it ran last week, it will get the last week's worth of bib records from cloud library, as opposed to like every record they they've gotten the entire thing. And then these last two config files here or config options are strictly just for cloud library. If you're connecting to cloud library, where you would tell the script where to find your certificate and your key. This has to do with API authentication. All right. This is a big one. It's called source name. <clears throat> this is a way to keep track of the set of records in the database. This string value will be entered into config.bib source. That's the database table if it doesn't already exist. And then all imported records will be tagged with this string value as the source. And it's important to note here that auto record deduplication does not cross sources unless you tell it otherwise. Um, so whenever you import records uh, with this tool and it's the same source over and over again, it's only going to look for its own uh, duplicate partners within the set of records it's imported already. Doesn't It doesn't go across sources, like it says. Uh, so therefore, if you have multiple electronic mark records imports, it might be a good idea to use the same source value for each such that the records can merge onto each other. So if you expect overdrive records to be coming in from overdrive and you expect some records to be coming in from, I don't know, uh, Hoopla, and there might be some overlap in titles and this the exact same bibs, you might actually set and you and you have this tool importing both some from archive and one config file, some from canopy and another config file, you might actually set the source name for both of those to be something more generic like electronic or something like that so that it can uh, dedupe itself across the two different vendor sets of bibs. And then it, uh, it you know, melts state 56s together with the appropriate participant nine. Uh, does everybody know what I mean by nines, by the way, on Evergreen? I got some confused faces. Um, that's Evergreen's special little mechanism for search scoping. So these bibs don't turn up in searches where they're not where they don't belong. Um, they only should come up when a particular library is being scoped in the search. Uh, so there's some a couple examples down there what that would look like in the config file: source name equal overdrive or source name equal electronic. You can use any string you want. And I think I've got a slide here showing you the picture. So this is the front end of what the source name, what I'm talking about. So it, it literally would introduce a new item in this drop-down menu here on the interface. So once the very first time the script runs with whatever string you've configured in there, it will insert a new uh, thing in this menu here. Whatever word you type in there will show up here and then everybody will see it <laughs> there in forever. 
Okay, another part of the config is what I'm calling bib tag. And think of this as a record subcategory. So you've got your big category electronic, and then you might have a tag. And this is where maybe you would be more granular with your naming conventions, like overdrive advantage, you know, or gov docs, something like that. Okay, this config is confusing, but it's in there for a particular reason. But basically, the takeaway is it should always be yes. <laughs> Set this to yes. Um, it's only be disabled if you're importing records that you exported from Evergreen to begin with. So if you manually exported a bunch of records out of Evergreen and then you brought them back in, you probably want to use this tool to import them with this set to no because they wouldn't be TCN uh, authority. All right, participants, we talked about this in earlier slides. Uh, this is a comma separated list of your short name of all your branches or participating systems, okay? So if this tool is gonna to be configured to import mark records and they're going to encounter some electronic bibs, this is where you would list off all of the participating libraries for this import. Um, so I threw in some examples like system, you could put a whole system in there, system one, system two. So that could be your uh, level one, level two, or you could do a list of branches or you could do a mixture of some systems and branches uh, like that. And it will, uh, that's where the dollar sign nines come in. Okay, and then there's an option for whether you actually want it to merge nines or not. Um, I think most people want it, want it to merge the nines. Then there's another option if you want to import as is. So some of this tool will manipulate the mark as it's coming in and you can short circuit that and just keep it from doing anything to the mark at all. And it'll just import it as is, just a quick short circuit. File name matching, this one's interesting. So if you're connecting to an FTP server to gather up a bunch of records, but um, there's a bunch of other records on there that you don't want it to pay attention to, or you only want it to pay attention to these names, or you want to ignore these names, those kinds of things. This is where you can configure file name fragments. Um, I'm sorry that's covered up, but um, for example, you only want it to process files that are on the server that have the word magazine in it or MRC, you know, there's a space there. It's kind of hard to see on the slide, but you could, you can have any number of phrases listed out, any number of fragments of file names and it'll search and it only include files with that match that name and case doesn't matter uppercase, lowercase, it just lowercases everything and checks it. Um, so this is a way to filter the records before it even tries to process them. And you can't see it. Hmm. Can't get that off. Uh, there's authority files in, in this list beneath, behind that. <laughs> it says authority files. And this would be where you would describe to the tool the naming convention of an authority file. So it would be treated as an authority file as opposed to a bib file. And those de definitely need to be separated in the brain of this thing. It wouldn't know the difference. It just looks like mark records to the tool. But if it's got a certain name on it that you configure here, it would go down the path of the processing as an authority record. Okay, so talking about authorities, uh, this tool needs to know the path to this authority script right here, which is an evergreen script. And that's typically where it is on your server. But if you happen to put it somewhere else, you'd have to configure it here. Um, the authority link script CMD uh, config here and you give it the whole string of how that command would be run on the command line. <laughs> anyway, um, I'd also like to say that the line breaks are free the presentation. So this in the config file, if you were looking at the config file, that would just be one line. There wouldn't be multiple lines there. All right, and the staged bib overlay directory. So back to authorities again, if you're going to process authorities, part of the authority process is using a tool out of the migrations tool repository, because <laughs> that's where a lot of the logic is in importing authority records on in Evergreen. So it needs to know where that is. There's the GitHub repository there. So you clone that and give it the path to that. 
Okay, and then the email notifications we talked about. Uh, you have three options. You've got an error email list, a success email list, and an always email list. So a list of email addresses, comma separated with any, any amount of emails that you wanted to email, it'll email. Um, so if you only want a certain set of people to get the errors, you know, you would put those over here and the successes could be a completely different set of people and the people like the error list would want to go maybe the server administrators, for example. And then the successes would probably go to the catalogers, for example. And so this server administrators probably wouldn't necessarily want to know about all of the chatter that's happening out of this thing. And so maybe only catalogers would be interested in that. And then there's another line for always email. So regardless, you can have a single email address that it will always email in addition to the success and fails. Any questions so far? I think I'm going pretty quick. Yeah? No? Bib records? Yeah. Right. Right. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. All right. I can see everybody got it was really exciting at first. And now everybody's like, oh, bib records, right. Okay. All right. So kind of the last thing about this is the mark manipulations. And that gets kind of complicated pretty quickly. Um so I have a whole dedicated section for that. This is an example of the config file. If you wanted to add a field to the mark, you would say mark edit underscore standard, meaning you are interested in it editing a standard field, not one of the control fields. And then you give it a number, number one in this case. And each time that you want to have an, uh, a compounded list of things you wanted to do, you would increment that number. So it'd be mark edit standard one, and this is the first thing you wanted to do to the mark record. And then you'd say mark edit standard two, and then you'd have another thing that you wanted to do to the mark record. And this is example here, we're adding a field. So the type is add, the definition is a 650 with an indicator one of a zero, and the indi um, yeah, the indicator one of a zero, and the indicator two of a zero, and then the subfield A. And we want that value to be in the subfield A. And that would be added to the mark record with that configuration exactly like that. As it's to all of the mark records coming in from the source, from wherever you're getting these. If you want to remove a field, so this again is mark edit standard two. So this would be the second manipulation to a mark record. And this type is remove. And the definition here is self-explanatory. We wanted to remove all the 852s, the 853s, and the 995s. Just, just strip them out completely, no matter what. And then there's a conditional remove. So if you say remove and how many, this is a new concept. You can throw in how many. And if you say all, or you could say one or two or three or some value of how many of these. And then you define it like this. Uh, and each one of these is is an 856 with a sub an indicator of four, indicator one of four, and indicator two of none, blank, null, slash, however you want to call it. And it can't if it's anything other than none, then it doesn't match, and it has to have a subfield three. If all of that stuff matches, we're, then we're going to remove that field from the mark record, and you can comma separate a number of definitions here where you want to remove. An 856, where the first subfield is a one and the second subfield is a one, and there's a subfield A. If all of those things are true, strip the 856 out. And you can you get it as we go along. Uh, all is a kind of a new concept in this format where you can say an indicator one, an indicator two of all. So anything that appears there is irrelevant as far as matching. As long as there's a subfield B, it will take away the 856, or sorry, the 651 in this case. All right, and this is an example of removing subfields. So we have a mark edit standard four. We've we've done four iterations of these mark edits, and we've got a type now of remove subfield, and we've got a how many we want to remove all, and we want to remove all the 756 queues, period. And that would just strip out just the queues of all the 756s, leaving whatever's left of the 756. 
However, I think there's logic in there that if that is the last subfield, it will remove the whole field. Um, so if if it turns out that that Q is the only thing in that whole field, the whole field goes away too. Now there's the concept of replace. And replace is interesting because it will find a match and then replace it. And if there isn't one, it'll add. So it becomes an add if there isn't one that matches. And this is might be kind of self-explanatory here, but uh, all, we're going to replace all the 856s and same meaning whatever match it has, we want it to just be the same indicator one and the same indicator two that it found. We don't want to change those things. And the subfield Y needs to be changed to click for online content, for example. And that will replace how many? All. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, and then these are some examples of, of dealing with control fields. And so, so far, we've only talked about mark editing the standard fields. It's a little bit different for control fields since control fields um, don't have subfields. So control one, control two, control three, you do have to iterate the number at the end because it makes it a unique config in the config file. If there's two configs with the exact same thing, it only takes the last one. So you do have to, in the config, you have to iterate your configs. All right, uh, type replace. This is an example where we're gonna replace the 008 at position number 24, and we're gonna put an O in that spot. Uh, that happens to be, term, make, basically means make this bib electronic. Uh, o and what is it, S uh, and E maybe? I can't remember, huh? Q. So those, those make it electronic, and then Evergreen reads that and says, oh, we put the icon for electronic book there, okay? So maybe that's something that you want to do. That would be a common thing. Or you want to remove the 007, for example. You could do it like that. Uh, or you could replace the 007. And then this is an interesting concept. Um, just like in the 008, we define a number. That means what position in the control field we're manipulating. We're going to start on character one. So at the very beginning, we're just going to start on character one. And I'm going to stick in there that whole entire uh, 007 field, which is like, I think that's video. Uh, translates to video. And then there's, I think the C or the V means DVD. I think maybe probably like the V there, the second V means DVD. Uh, I lifted that out of a catalog somewhere. <laughs> uh, so that's how you can set this thing up to um, automatically retrieve records from a remote, or you can feed it into a folder, and you can set up your config to exactly the way you want it to treat the records and dedupe them in its own compartmentalized area. Or there's a thing you can pass for it to go and look for bibs elsewhere in the database. And now you can sit back and relax and leave it to bib magic, and you can get other work done. Oh yeah, I forgot reporting. So after all that's done and maybe uh, you get that email report and maybe months go by and you kind of forget about what did it do? Well, it's recorded. It, so you have a track of what happened at what time and what records it manipulated and so on. So this goes directly into the Evergreen database. It's called Bib Magic. Of course it is. And um, I'm gonna go down. So. There's a table called job in the day. Yeah. Doing it the last time right before it crashed. Um, and then it's got a current action number. So every action it takes during its execution, it's increments that number by one. So it took one action and then it, you know, inserted this thing and then it did another action. So we're on, we're on action number 345 and then it crashed and then what status it was. So this is a track of how the job is doing at a, at a bird's eye view. Okay. And then there's another table called import status. This is really the, the meat and potatoes of the whole thing. Um, this records the bib tag. This is a record for records. So every line, every row in this table is a record. 
um, the file name from which the record came from. The 001 is broken out into its own uh, column for fun. And the title is also broken out there for fun. And then there's a SHA-1, which has to do with matching and how it, how it deals with uh, its own internal matching mechanism. Uh, the status of that particular record during its execution, it goes in as new, and then it goes through processing, and then it goes into overlaid, or it goes into inserted. Um, and then the update time, and then the XML of the mark record is recorded there. And then what you can't see is a record ID. All right, and now we have a table called mark updates. So during its execution, uh, it, it keeps track of the previous mark of any mark record that it might have overlaid. So this enables reversibility. So uh, the, the record ID there is recorded, and then the previous mark is recorded here, and then the, the new mark, the changed mark is here, and then it keeps track of a yes, no question if it was a new bib or not, and then what time it was updated. All right, and now we have item reassignment. This is the pain point, I think, in Evergreen, the way it is now when you merge two bibs together or three or four or five bibs together, and they, all of the items on all of the bibs get onto one bib, and you want to reverse that. I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's a way to know where the items, which item came from which bib that was merged. This thing keeps track of that. So if you did want to undo it, it keeps track of what item was on what bib that it merged when it merged them. Um, make, it makes it so that you can execute it in reverse. <clears throat> and then this is the table that it keeps track of its merges. So lead record, sub record, and win. And then there's a nine sync table. This keeps track of whenever you sync the nines, it'll uh, tell you the affected URLs and the nines that it synced and when. Okay. And there's an example email that it fires off. It's just no frills. Hi team, thanks for your files. Took me some time to work on it. Zero days, zero hours, and seven minutes, 30 seconds. I digested these files. And file number one with the name of the file, there was 147 total records. I inserted 144 and three of them were matched and overlaid. Thank you for that file. File number two, was this one here, ebook one, it had 474 total records and 462 were inserted and 12 were matched and overlaid. Thank you for that file. The grand total is blah, 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 blah. And the import type for this was a folder import. So this is an example of somebody just dropping files into a folder and then the cron comes along, sweeps them up and the thing imports them and gives you the, gives you the report. Uh, yours truly, the friendly Mobius server. <laughs> okay, the end. Now, uh, on this slide, I have the link to this slide deck and then also the launchpad bug. This um, code is incidentally in the working repository and there's a, there's a launchpad bug and some discussion and I've added the code uh, available for anybody to use it or maybe it'll get merged. Um, it's set up to drop right into Evergreen and it might it could just be a part of the project directly. Um, it took some work to make it Evergreen E as opposed to the way I originally designed it. So it's it doesn't rely on any external Perl modules or anything like that. So it's literally just one file siloed off on its on its own. And it's there's nothing to it. Um, it's complete with the documentation and the release notes and et cetera, et cetera. So did I just just totally slaughter the time? Oh, that's not bad. Any questions? Yes. What happens? Okay, if what happens if you use a bib sort that already existed? I don't think it's that much of a problem. It's just that uh, any incoming records coming from the vendor will will be uh, um, able to merge or dedupe onto your existing bibs that have that same bib source. That's the main thing. Um, yeah. So the question is, what are the uh, implications of submitting delete files? And actually, that was on a slide, but it was covered up by the translations. One of those file name things back there. Let me let me see if I can find that slide. This one, maybe. Um. 
remove file. Okay, you can just see it. So remove files was something, I don't think I said it out loud, but there, there is a config for removal files. And that would be where you would define fragments of file names that would indicate that this file is actually a delete file. And I'm glad you brought that up because it does take care of that. So if if uh, the vendor is you know trying to remove from the collection or you're no longer subscribing to whatever things that used to be subscribing to and you need to delete them, you could feed this those files and you would say a file name with the word delete in the file name or the word weed in the file name or the word removal or whatever file name convention that um, you're you're dealing with you would tell this script how to how to know that it's a removal and it will instead of inserting the file it will then find the matches and remove them from the database uh, and the report would be as such in the re in the uh, email report <laughs> Um, any other questions? In terms of adding lines, had um, just one uh, addition per line, just the syntax for that is a little different from removals. And so for every subfield you want to add, you have to have a separate subfield line. So ah, you mark, manip mark manipulations you're talking about? Yeah. Let me see if I can find what you're talking about. This one? One, so, the so here your subfields are comma separated values as opposed to having the description. Right, line. right. So when you want to add, you have to have a separate standard line for each add. So That's right. Yep. You, you wouldn't be able to combine them in, in the add. No. Now if you come down and or, or I think the replace is set up like that as well. Yeah. See so replace is sort of defined the same way. Uh yeah. So if you were going to add multiples. You'd have to have a mark edit, in this case, mark edit standard five, and you'd define one definition, and then you'd have a mark edit standard six and define another one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we've been using this tool for years and years and years. It started off probably in 2014 in infancy, and it took care of a problem. And then, well, hey, that thing was working pretty good. Why don't, somebody else wanted to use it, and but we, but it's not quite meeting this, the needs of the new person. So there's another, uh, it's, it's FTP or it's archive. We need to go get it from a cloud library. You know, we need to, and so we bolted down these other external, you know, and it ended up where we are now. And the most recent thing was this mark manipulations. It's really great, but. But uh, it's not editing the mark, and the mark's coming in poorly from you know wherever it's coming from, and we're catalogers, and those things are junk, and we don't want that polluting our catalog, blah blah blah. So we um, you know we attempted to try to get it to where it can automatically do that, so nobody has to touch these things, uh, you know, on a daily basis or a weekly basis, however often you're importing these records. Um, this thing should be able to get configured for to meet your needs, to reach out and get the records bring them in, edit them, delete them, um, and including all the way up and including authority records. Yeah. Yeah. Reingest. No, no reingest needed. Nope. Yeah. Uh, it creates its own schema. And I don't I have any slides here showing off the Evergreen reporter, but a part of the patch includes edits to the FMIDL, so it becomes available to the Evergreen Reporter, standard reporter. So, in, uh, you know, you can run reports on this stuff, uh, the results of these imports in the Evergreen Reporter. Stunned in silence. Yes. The config? Yes. Yes. That's the next step. I think it would be super great if this was sort of like Vandalay on crack or something, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Vandalay has a lot of these same features, although I think a lot of us will, will admit that it, it has some shortcomings in terms of volume. I mean, if you're trying to do, you know, 100,000 records, you're going you're gonna to have a bad day. Uh, and this thing, this thing chews through that no problem. Uh, we do 100,000, 200, 300,000, no problem. Um, it takes longer than seven minutes and 40 seconds, but it will, it will get done and, you know, it can run on your utility server. It doesn't take a lot of resources, single threaded, so it's pretty nice. It can run on its own time. It could take a day or two or three. Um, it will get done and it'll finish and give you the report. 
and you don't have to do anything except for set it up. That's that's the idea is that once it's set up and in place, you can completely remove this whole part of your work out of your brain and just does it. And you get the you get the product at the end, the email saying, Hey, thank you for your files, and they're in there for you now. Yeah. That's all I got, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your... Uh